hello. I'm excited to be here at this fantastic conference. Um, I think I have the longest title. Okay, where's the switch? Uh, I don't see the button. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, oh, no. Mirroring, mirroring. Hello. There we go. Okay. Okay, it's a little bit big. Better. Uh, sorry, so um, the title could have been shorter. It could have been just how I, sedu how, uh, how I was seduced by a technology. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this talk is, is, I was fortunate to work at Interactive Things. I'm no longer with them. Uh, I, I joined another company one month ago. But this talk is very, very much a result of our collaborative efforts at Inf Interactive Things to find uh, a tool stack and architecture which uh, allows us, allowed us to build uh, middle and larger scale interactive visualizations for the web. So especially Jeremy Stuckey made a lot of, put a lot of effort in that. Uh, so my background is uh, computer science, I, software engineering. I started uh, my career like uh, in early 2000s. I worked mostly on UIs, web stuff, and some data analysis. At some point, I was so fascinated by, by one of uh, Hans Rosling's videos that I decided to, to learn more about database, and I did a PhD with, <laughs> <laughs> with Enrico Bertini and Daniel Alain. It helped to learn some basics, but the nitty-gritty uh, uh, on the theoretical side, of course, but the nitty-gritty stuff of engineering data visualization that I had to learn like by doing. And uh, so I worked uh, at Interactive Things that helped me a lot to learn lots of things. And before that, I participated in some projects. I will show you very quickly, because it's not a portfolio talk, but so that you better understand what's my background, like some of the works I did. I've used many tools, Java, uh, Adobe, Flex, which I kind of liked, um, JavaScript, D3, Backbone, React, uh, lots of D3, lots of D3. <coughs> React, backbone, uh, mapping stuff. So, uh, yes, this is uh, my current project. I, I, I work at a startup called Terralytics, where, where we are looking at visualizing people mobility. Uh, so, there are, I'm the only one at the moment doing the front end. By the way, if you want to join me, let me know. So. Uh, there are lots of big data analysts, so it's big data about people moving in cities, and uh, I'm building the front end, so that's what I've built so far. It's kind of a dashboard where we have a sleepy map with showing how many people walk in different streets in di at different times, and there will be more, like, more and more views, m different controls, the views are interconnected, so it's like a dashboard which, will s which has to be scalable. So the architecture, I had to choose for that, has to be scalable, flexible, and had, has a very have a very good component model. So I chose React for that, or rather an architecture enabled by React. And I'll try to explain you why today, why it makes sense. But first, a little bit of history, so to say. So I think that like visualization is a lot about communication, right? So we want to tell people what we know, or we want to help data, so to say, to tell stories by, by themselves, right? That are hidden in the data. So, and the media is also very important, which we use to tell those stories. So our far ancestors left us these rock paintings, which we can still enjoy, which is fantastic. Our not that far ancestors used paper, and they could put more, more information on it, right? But it's not always a good thing, right? Because if you put too much data in one thing, it becomes very, Overwhelming, overwhelming and hard to understand what's going on, although it's potentially more informative. So we are now have all those interactive devices, right? We have to deal, we have to take advantage of them because there is really a lot of potential. We can support interactive exploration. We can show one facet of the data at a time 
And I personally believe that like, for addressing the challenges of uh, which, which big data poses, uh, interactivity is a key. So, so we, need, we don't have enough pixels to show all the data at the same time on the screen, right? So we have to summarize it. But if we summarize it, we reduce it. And we have to allow the user to summarize it in different ways so it can be explored. WebGL will not solve all of the problems. Uh, interactivity also helps to find personal stories. So users explore the data and they choose their, their path. They choose what they are interested in. And of course, it can be more engaging um, if designed well. But it's very hard, actually, I can tell you, to design a good uh, interactive application. This is like a simple network exploration tool which allows to explore it on the separate levels and has like different views. Um, it was, uh, it cost me a lot of sweat to, to develop this and to make it work on different platforms also. So, I mean, it's a simple thing. Why, 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 why is it so hard? Uh, <clears throat> why is interactivity hard, in fact? It's because which, with every new interactive feature we add to the system, we had a new potential state, or potentially many states, right? Which the system can be in. And uh, the more states we have, the more transitions we have between those states, right? It's a combinatorial growth. And we have to model all those transitions. We have to make sure that they are um, still, that we always still have a consistent representation of the data, even when the transition is after a transition run, right? When, uh, <clears throat> And because we have so many of them, it becomes very, very difficult to ensure that we are really doing it in a consistent way all the time. Uh, do we really have to do it this way? Is there a way around? Maybe. So uh, <clears throat> this is the great grammar of graphics by Leland Wilkinson. What, what this book taught us? It taught us, actually, that uh, Nearly any statistical graphic can be expressed declaratively by defining a mapping from the data to some visual elements, right? We just define how data elements are transformed and um, what are the aesthetic properties of the graphical elements, geometric objects which are finally rendered by the computer. Um, and it's, it's beautiful because it's so simple and declarative, right? So it's basically defining a function. So if we are speaking about visualizations for the web, right? Function which maps data to DOM objects on our web page. Um, and we know that this model works really well because there are so many implementations which have been developed so far and still are developed, which are very successful. But are they really scalable in terms, like if we have a more complex application with many components which depend on each other. Um, <clears throat> I mean, how can we apply the same, the same model? Does it work? Um, not directly. So th this is an example of our work which we did for Neue Zürcher Zeitung, the Swiss newspaper. It tells a story about the events of the First World War. You can see that, like, uh, it's a pretty complex interface. There are lots, of, lots and lots of uh, components. They are uh, interdependent. Uh, there is like another whole another separate view showing uh, like the armies of different countries, their sizes and when they engaged into the war. There are um, <coughs> uh, some additional views here. You can interact with the map as well. So it's a pretty complex application, and it would have been much more difficult to build with uh, D3 alone. Uh, so we used React to package the whole application. And uh, so what, what does D3 have to offer for such larger applications? We have this uh, reusable chart pattern, right, which is very nice. It can help us to package one specific particular chart into like encapsulated component and then reuse it in different places. But it doesn't really tell us how to handle the whole application state, how the data flows in the whole application. It doesn't allow us, or doesn't tell us at least, how, how to compose components, which is really important to build those uh, middle and large scale applications. And essentially it's always the same problem. We have many components which are interdependent 
And we have too many dependencies in, uh, between them, which are difficult to take care of, and so that it's consistent. So what, what has the industry, uh, what has been the industry standard for developing large US? It's MVC, right? For 30 years already. Um, <clears throat> we have model controller in view. We have the data in the model. Uh, the view is what, what we see on the screen. And controller figures how to like <clears throat> control, controls the data flow between the model and controller uh, and the view. If we speak about using it for data viz on the web, we can put the D3 part, the D3 code in the view, right? And we can like, the, the controller takes care of sending the right data. It, it works, it helps to encapsulate uh, <clears throat> logic and separate it from the view. But I mean, again, it's the same problem. We have lots of components, they are interdependent. The models uh, are interdependent. When, when something changes, we have to update the right models and update the right views. Lots of dependencies. Also, uh, here we have like models which are designed specifically for the views. And uh, that results in data being scattered, right? The, our application state is scattered across the models. There's no one uh, source of truth. Also, sometimes it's even redundant, which of course doesn't contribute to consistency. So it could be improved, maybe, if we just do it in this way. We, we get the application state right, right? We can encapsulate it without thinking too much about how we represent it um, at first. But then we define like this mapping from the application state to the actual representation. That's it. So it could be something like this. So we have a big application state, right? And we have a component hierarchy. And the application state gets rendered here. And if we have some interactive thing, some button, which uh, the user clicks, we eventually propagate this uh, event to the app state, change the application state, and then do a render, right? Again. Very simple model. So it's actually very much in the sense of uh, Grammar of the grammar of graphics. We have data and we map it to DOM objects, right? We have an application state and map it to DOM objects. And over time, application state changes, but the mapping from the application state to the DOM object doesn't. It's always the same, right? So um, <coughs> it's it important, so called. Over time, this way we can develop an interactive application. So, I mean, it's a simple model, very nice. Why haven't we been doing this so far? Uh, there is one issue with it. It requires full render on each state change, right? And it can be costly. Um, well, but maybe there is a way around. And this is where React comes for the rescue. Because with uh, React, we have uh, this notion of the virtual DOM. So it's a virtual representation of the actual DOM uh, tree, which gets eventually rendered in the browser. Why virtual? Because virtual is uh, easier to manipulate, right? It doesn't, it's not that costly. The actual DOM is very costly to change because any change can, can cause a reflow, which is very, very costly. Uh, so it's basically slow. But if we man manipulate the virtual DOM first, right, and figure uh, what we have to change in the actual DOM, this can be affordable. So uh, how React works, it's basically when a change happens, we keep track of the previous state of the virtual DOM. So this is the previous state. Uh, then something changed, right, in the virtual DOM representation. We see that this node uh, has changed. And the React runs a heuristic, a heuristic algorithm to, which tries to identify the minimal set of changes. Not optimal, but like with some heuristics which, so that it runs uh, in predictable time. Uh, <clears throat> which uh, mutate the actual, the actual DOM in the browser, in the browser so that uh, it represents our most recent state, right? So we basically do the minimal set of changes to come from, from this state to this state. And the virtual DOM is a, a way to describe this actual, the state of the visual representation. So with this approach, full render becomes affordable. And it actually, enables uh, this architecture uh, which I was talking about before. So let's see, at some, let's see some examples. This is the simplest hello world. What is going on here? So we have a 
virtual representation of uh, a div, right? HTML or DOM element uh, with hello as text and a class uh, named greeting. We have to use class name instead of class because class is a keyword in JavaScript. And uh, so here we create this virtual representation of this uh, node. And, but here we tell React to render it in the actual DOM and it will be rendered as a child of document body, right? Very simple. So uh, React is uh, coming with uh, something called JSX. It's basically a syntaxical, syntaxical sugar for JavaScript, which allows us to use uh, HTML or HTML-like text within our J J JavaScript code, right? I find it, it's not mandatory to use it, but I find it very useful because you see right away where are the DOM um, objects. Like, it, it, it sends out in your code. Um, so I'll use it throughout the examples. But it's doing the same thing as this, right? It's, it gets transpiled into plain JavaScript, if you use it. So one very good thing about React is it's very strong component model. Basically, it's all you do when you develop applications with React. You, you, you create components, and each component basically is a function which defines how data is mapped to, to its visual representation. So here we define a component called greeting, right? We say that it has a property name of the type string which is required. And uh, <clears throat> so this is the most important uh, function in a component, which is called render, and it basically creates the virtual representation of the DOM, which eventually will end up in the browser. And here's what we do to render it. So we say greeting, we pass a name as a parameter, and that's, that's the result, right? Uh, let's do some visualization. This is a scatter plot. We have some data, and we have a scatter plot component. We render uh, the scatter plot component passing some data to it, so this, this array, basically. And the render method uh, creates an SVG, uh, document. React works nicely with SVG, so we can do graphics in the browser with it. Uh, <clears throat> and here we just use a like the standard JavaScript map function to map uh, each data element to a circle. That simple. Forgive me, I, I'm using a bit of uh, ES6 syntax. You need a transpiler for that, but I find it easier to read. But this is basically just a function with two parameters. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, yes, it's pretty much in the sense of the grammar of graphics. We map data to um, visual representations. This could be improved a little bit. We could use scales for, for that, right? Like in, in the grammar of graphics or in D3. And actually, we can use D3 for that because D3 has lots of uh, visualization goodies which uh, are independent of the DOM manipulation, right? Actually, we can use most of the functions from D3, even some of those which manipulate uh, DOM, I will show you later. Uh, the only function we really cannot use is append, or we shouldn't at least. So let's see, we use the scales from D3 here. We defined scale for x, y, and uh, the radius. And we just use them here, plain and simple. Uh, I think it reads even better than D3, but it's not the point. <laughs> So uh, let's do some changes. That's where it becomes more interesting. So we have an update function which uh, basically re-renders the whole thing every time, uh, passing new randomly generated data to the same component, right? And he here in the SVG we have an onClick handler which basically just calls the update function. So when I click, it re-renders. Uh, great, not very impressive yet. But the cool thing about this is that, I mean, we could do the same thing with D3, but the cool thing is that this scatterplot component, right now it's just one component, but it could have been the whole application and it wouldn't have changed much, right? We could re-render the whole application in just one uh, function call without it costing too much. Uh, okay, animation. So we do some changes, maybe we want to animate them. This is where React does not excel that 
much at the moment. However, it still works. So, like the straightforward approach is uh, uh, to to introduce uh, t, a parameter, part of the state, right, which says uh, like in what time mo moment of time we are in the animation, and then just twin twin uh, the animation based on this time moment, and use the standard React re-render cycle, right? But that mean that means that we have to to do the diff operation on each change, right? And for this particle uh, system kind of, uh, this is basically the worst use case for which you can apply React because here every single node is changing on every single uh, update. And there is no point in doing the diff because we know it's changing every time. It only costs something. So if we do the same thing uh, with plain D3, it's much smoother because there is no this diff operation. These examples were uh, prepared by my colleague, Jeremy Stucki. You can find them on his uh, blog's page. So, uh, <clears throat> but there are some, so I mean, it still works, but it's uh, slow if we do it this way. You can, you can take a <clears throat> pragmatic approach. What if we say, okay, we are not really caring about the internal state of the animation, for the whole application state, right? Uh, we can just use D3 transitions to animate between the states. And this works. It's a little bit of a slippery road because uh, React is not anymore in the full control of the rendering. But, um, I mean, it works with a little bit of care. So we have this component update, did update. So um, uh, React has those uh, life cycle events, it, they are so called. For each component, you can like implement those methods. And this one gets called each time the, the component is updated, right? And here, at this point, we actually have the, the real DOM node we can operate on. In the rendering phase, we don't have this node because it's not yet been rendered or not necessarily. Here, we just create the virtual representation of our, our node. But in the, some of the life cycle events, we can manipulate the actual DOM nodes. And here we can run a D3 transition, which works. <clears throat> we can even emulate entering and exiting transitions, which uh, D3 has. Because normally, this is a, li a little bit more tricky, but it, it still works. Uh, <clears throat> normally, React, if, you, if you, your render method, uh, after a subsequent render, removes some element, right? React will remove it from the actual DOM straight away. So there will be nothing to run this exiting transition on, right? So we have to tell somehow React to keep it for a while, while we are running the transition. And this is what uh, this transition group uh, does. It basically adds two additional uh, lifecycle events, which are not there by default, uh, which we can use to run an animation, then call a callback when we are done, so that React knows, OK, now I can remove it. So kind of works. But they are actually working on better support, uh, Facebook, I mean, uh, for animation. And we can expect that in the future it will be supported. But even now, you can do things. But it, you tend to develop applications with less animations. At least, at least I tend to. At least at first. And then you add animations as needed. Um, OK, here's just a simple example of uh, one project. I worked on, so internet permits. Yeah, here you, I hope you can see the, 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 those flows are animated. And the project is built with, with React, but uh, this animation is a plain D3 animation run, running via D3 timer. So it's, again, pragmatic approach. But the, for the rest of the application, it's actually absolutely relevant that, that these flows are animated, right? So it doesn't have to be a part of the actual state of the application. So, uh, <clears throat> never mind. Uh, let's do some interactive stuff. This, this is about interaction. This is the fun stuff. We can create a slider component, which works, <laughs> which we can manipulate. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> what we have? Uh, we have properties with height, title, value, on value change. This is a function which we have to, like, the parent component wants to get notified when there is some change. 
right? Uh, the value actually is not part of this component, right? It's, it's not part of the state. It's, it will be part of the whole application state. And it gets value injected, so to say, as a parameter, and uh, the slider only knows how to render it, right? Um, we have another lifecycle event, component did mount, which get called as soon as the node, actual DOM node is created. And here we can in initialize some non-React stuff. Like here we use D3 drag behavior, which is very useful for creating something like this. We could also use standard uh, React events for that, but drag behavior has also support for touch, which is, which is nice. Why not use it? So handle drag gets called by the drag uh, behavior. And here we just basically take the mouse position and calculate the value we have to notify the parent of the new value. So now let's try to build the application, like, which has an application state. This is, this is a simple way to put, put it together, right? We encapsulate our application state. We have only one property density in this case. We have a getter and a setter. Uh, when the setter gets called, we render, right? Very simple approach. And we have a component for our whole application now, not just slider. But here we do comp compose. We take our slider component and then it, add it here. Then we have a diff with the actual density value, which you can see here, right? And the render function, which gets called when we change something, just renders everything, the whole application, to the document body. So you can see we change something, we see th the new value. Cool, that's quite simple. We created the scatterplot component before, right? Remember, why not reusing it? We just take it, we pass the right data to it, and uh, so I added something to the application state, right? The points and the opacity, another property which we can uh, change here, and, and it works. So th that's how it works. It's really, really straightforward to compose your large application out of components which you define uh, and which are like functions. It's important. That means that given the same data, they render the same result, right? If they are like this, it's really easy to compose. So yes, that's basically we built an example of this application or using this architecture. If you're getting really serious about this, you should look at Flux. It's a pattern proposed by uh, Facebook for building applications enabled uh, by React. But it's very similar. There are a few new uh, <coughs> concepts like store. Store is uh, basically application state with a business logic, but uh, in a Flux application, you can have multiple, multiple stores. In some cases, you want to better modular, modularize your stores. I'm not always sure it's a good idea. I, I also like the idea of one big application state. Uh, <clears throat> but if you have multiple stores, uh, then you also need a dispatcher, which uh, like given an action for which in Flux there is also an explicit expression. It's like a, an object which specifies an action which you can pass from a component to the dispatcher. And the dispatcher figures out in what order the stores have to be up updated, if there are dependencies between them, so nothing goes wrong. So, but the idea is very similar. The, the, the data flow goes in, uh, always in the same uh, direction. Uh, there are no dependencies between the components, except from parent to child. Uh, something really new, which uh, was announced recently by Facebook, but hasn't been yet open sourced, is really, it's like an iteration of Flux. And here the idea is that, uh, as far as I understand, that uh, each component spe specifies its data needs, right? You don't anymore have to pass the data from the parent components down the hierarchy to the, to the lower level components. You just say in every single component which data it needs. And the system figures out how to uh, feed the components with the data. And even not only in the, on the client, it also fetches the data from the server in the most uh, efficient way so that there is no overfetching and underfetching, which is really, really cool. But we have to wait. 
until it's released. So if the internet permits, I hope. Does it? Does it? Maybe not. I want to show a little bit. Uh, it doesn't seem to work. So a sleepy map example. Sleepy map, like uh, like Google Maps. Um, <clears throat> so um, here we basically have uh, it's a rewrite of uh, an example for a plugin for D3 called D3 GeoTile, <clears throat> which uh, basically allows us to, like for, for a given uh, projection um, of Mercator, for a given setting, scale and translate, right? To, f to calculate the numbers of the tiles we would need to, uh, to download from OpenStreetMap, for instance. Um, which we have to show, actually, actually draw in the application, right? So there must be actually two kinds of tiles here, which we cannot see for some reason, because these are these are raster tiles, right? These are just images. So I have here a component for raster tiles, and there are there must be also vector tiles. So it should look something like this. Yeah, it seems that the internet is not working. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll try a different connection, the secret one. Let's see, let's see, let's see. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so, uh, OK, great. So we have uh, our sleeper map component. It has width, height, and center. Center position is Boston in this case. Uh, get initial state. So uh, components in, in React can also have internal state. Usually you don't need that, but sometimes you, you have some state which only this component should know about, right? It, if it's irrelevant for the whole for the rest of the application, in this in the, in the case of the sleeper map, it can be either I think depending on the application. But here we, we just keep it within the component, and if it gets changed from within the component, the component gets re rendered automatically. So our state is scale and translate, right? It's like like the projection settings. Component did mount. Here we initialize our zoom behavior. Um, again, it's using the, the, the D3 magic. Uh, <clears throat> zoomed gets called when, when uh, the user interacts with the map, and it changes the, the internal state of the component, which leads to a re-render. Get projection, get transform, uh, and the actual render. Here we use this uh, GeoTile plugin, which gives us the list of tiles we have to actually show, fetch from the server and show. So there are two kinds of tiles, as I said. Raster tiles are the images, and vector tiles are basically uh, <coughs> tiles of geometry, geojson geometries, which we can render as a vector path, and we can apply some uh, visual, visual mapping to it. So here they are rendered. So we have the simple raster tile component and the vector tile component. Vector tile component also fetches the actual uh, geometries from the server when it gets mounted. And then, so we set state, internal state of the, the geometries. It leads to a re-render. And then we can actually draw the, the, the geometries, right, as paths, as SVG paths. So this is how it works. Uh, slow, right? Is it the fault of React? Yes. <laughs> The thing is that we always re-render, right? And here we have a costly operation, tile path. It does the reprojection. Do we really have to do this every time we want to pan or zoom? No. Uh, <clears throat> there is something called shoot component update in React. Um, it's basically a way to say, OK, this part of the tree of the virtual dome, I don't want it to be re-rendered. I know that nothing has changed, right? By default, everything gets re-rendered. So a render of every single node in the virtual DOM representation is called. Sometimes we know that we don't want it. So here we can basically say next properties and next state. These are like the new values, values of the properties and of the internal state of the component. We can compare them to the previous state. If they haven't changed, we don't have to re-render. We re return false. So, but by just adding these 
method, we can make it much smoother, right? So, great. We could optimize something. Uh, so this is this method, should component update, which does the, makes the difference. If you ha are having performance problems with React, look at this, how you can improve it. Uh, immutable JS, something um, <clears throat> using immutable data structures is good. You know that. We, we use immutable strings in JavaScript and Java, and it's really good. Unfortunately, we don't, we don't use them for everything, like in Clojure. It's my favorite language, where everything is immutable. Uh, <clears throat> but there are libraries uh, for that, which we can use in JavaScript. Immutable JS was inspired by Clojure. And uh, <clears throat> what it can do, what it offers is basically a set of uh, a library for collections. We have maps, sets, lists, and so on, all immutable. It means when we change something, right, in, in our map, we get a new object. This will return false. It will be a new object, and the old object will still retain. So what does it, how does it help us, actually, here? The thing is that with this, we can implement should component update very efficiently, right? Imagine that you have a large data structure, uh, and you want to check where it has changed. What do you have to do in JavaScript? You have to do a deep comparison, which is very costly, right? What do you have to do with an immutable data structure? You have to compare the identities, which costs almost nothing. And that's the power of immutable objects. Unfortunately, uh, so you can, you can structure your application state using uh, immutable objects, but if you want to use it with D3, okay, that's not always easy. Many functions ex expect JavaScript uh, arrays, right, in JavaScript. So we need to convert, or we need to use JavaScript objects. So there's no perfect solution for that, unless we rewrite, rewrite D3. <laughs> so one other thing uh, I would like to mention is server-side rendering. You probably know that like, m most of the visualizations which, are, which we create on the web with D3 or other, or other libraries which use JavaScript to render something into the DOM, they produce something invisible to search engines. Right? Because search engines do not run our JavaScript and do not generate those uh, DOM elements. So, and this is not perfect. Uh, with React, because React uses virtual DOM, if you use uh, something like Node.js on the server, what we can do, we can use the same, exactly the same uh, code which we use on the client to produce the, the DOM representation of our uh, components, we can use it to render our application into a string, right? So my app is a React component, which you also use on the client. But here on the server, we basically say, render this to the string and send it back to the user, right? Uh, <clears throat> so the search engines will see it. They will not have to run our JavaScript code on the client. Uh, and also the user will see, like the ordinary users, we'll see the results earlier. They won't have to wait for our whole application to load and build those visual representations. So there are two advantages. Uh, <clears throat> what's, what's also very interesting and exciting is that there are other implementations of uh, <clears throat> React which uh, use other destinations for uh, other target platforms for rendering. There are, some, there are some, some libraries for rendering into Canvas. There is a new um, library called React Native made by Facebook where you can use uh, React to develop iOS and Android applications. There, are, however, there is, however, no support for graphics in React Native. Uh, there are only UI elements so far, but I, I'm sure it will come. Uh, <clears throat> there are some experiments even for WebGL, I think. Uh, although they don't look very promising at the moment. So, uh, but it's pretty exciting. It doesn't mean that you can run the same application which you write for the web, uh, for, for SVG, producing SVG, to, to, to use the same application to render it into Canvas or iOS, because you have other primitives, right? Our, our primitive components of, of which you build your application. 
but it's still like the same approach, the same idea, and it shows that the idea is good, I think. So React developer tools, I'll briefly show that. This presentation is actually a React application. Uh, <clears throat> and React developer tools is an extension for Chrome, which basically shows you your virtual DOM representation here, right? So you see I have app, this is my root component, slideshow, player, I can even see like the properties of this component which got passed by the parent current slide, uh, the internal state, and uh, it's pretty cool for debugging purposes. So hot code reloading. This is something cool too, okay. Um, uh, yes, here it is. So here we have a, an, a <coughs> five sliders, right? So I just set some values. Great, we see the average value. Here is the source code for that. Okay, <coughs> let's change mean to median, right? Did you see it change? A little bit, right? It was 69, became 67. Okay, we can change the label so that you, you surely see it. Average, let's remove value. Save, okay, it changed. So it got refreshed, right? So this changed. Did you see the sliders change? No, they didn't change. <laughs> <laughs> right, it, but it was a refresh, wasn't it? It wasn't really, it was a re-render, right? We re-rendered our application because the whole application is just one big function. We just run the render again. It rendered, even if we change some source code, we change the, uh, the render logic, right? But the state, did not, was not uh, thrown out. We still kept the same state as we had before we made the change. This is pretty amazing. Imagine if you have a complex application where we have to click 20 times to get to specific state which you are currently developing, right? You don't have to lose that with this approach. Only works with Webpack. But I highly recommend to use it uh, to package your application and manage dependencies. So, uh, okay. <clears throat> yes, this I showed you. One last thing I want to show. Um, this is from a highly recommended article uh, by David Nolan called The Future of the JavaScript, of JavaScript MVC Frameworks. Uh, <clears throat> what he did, he ran a com comparison. He implemented an application with uh, React and Ohm Ohm is a React wrapper which he made in CloneScript. It's basically React still in the, in, the, in the basis of it. And the same application, it's, it was to do MVC in Backbone, right? And this is uh, from Chrome Developer Tools. It, it's called uh, FlameTurt. So basically we see here functions which call other functions. So th this is time. This is a function which takes longer. This calls this function, this function, this function, and so far. Uh, <clears throat> so we see how much every function takes to, like, how many functions are, get called and how, how long they take to pro proceed. So first thing is that the backbone was slower than the React version, React and ohm. Uh, I, th I think it was like three times or something. Uh, the second thing is that the pattern of the function calls, it, you can see it's so much different, right? Here we have lots and lots of small functions which get called. We have one model which updates another model which has another dependency. It, 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 it leads to this very, very complex pattern of function calls. In React, we basically have, okay, re-render, do the difference, re-render, do the difference, and so forth. Which, which architecture is easier to reason about? You can guess, I think. So uh, to summarize, uh, React is fun to use, and it l enables architectures which uh, are easy to reason about because we avoid these unnecessary dependencies. It's case to large applications, and sometimes there are performance issues, but they can be dealt uh, with. But for some applications like particle systems, it's not the best choice, maybe. Although you can still develop a component, and within the component do something 
which does not use React for rendering still. It kind of works. Uh, so thank you. Uh, if you want to look at the source code of this presentation, you can find it on GitHub. It's a bit untidy, but I'll try to improve it in the next days. Thank you. <laughs>